research that I did along the way. Before I begin, I want to tell you that the most important thing you can do, you've already done, you're here, you're getting a college education, and I'm very proud of you for that, you should be proud of yourself. But it's not an easy journey, it's not something that is trivial, it's not something that is going to always be smooth. So it's the people that you make connections with, it's the people that you meet in your classes, it's the teachers that you interact with. They're going to make all the difference in how far you go and what you do from here on out. And I want, I hope that you can see that from the presentation I'm going to give you today, because it did definitely make a difference in my life, and um, it changed my entire future. Um, also, I want this presentation to be interactive, so if you have any questions along the way, don't hesitate to just like raise your hand and ask, because I'm going to incorporate my uh, research experiences into the presentation that I give you, because they were part of my life as I came along the way, and they shaped what I did. Um, so I'm not going to have like a separate talk about a part portion of this about what I did for research, so at any time, feel free to ask questions. Um, so when I first started community college, um, I was homeschooled. I graduated from high school when I was 16. Um, my family was very religious. They were not super f a huge fans of my going to college, but because I was so young, they figured, oh, a couple years of community college is not that big of a deal. Um, so they lent me a little bit of monetary support, but it wasn't like a huge amount of support. So I ended up waitressing. Um, and if any of you have ever worked in food service industry, it's definitely quite uh, a task after you put in a full day of five days. Um, so I waitressed and I taught music and um, moved completely out of this network, out of the area that I had grown up in. And I was at Quincy Community College, kind of on my own. So when I first got there, um, the first semester was fairly uneventful, but I didn't make any real connections. And it wasn't until the second semester that things really changed for me. And I'm very much a planner type of person. Um, I always sign up for classes the first day that they like open for registration. And for some reason that I'm really glad I did now, now I signed up for a psychology class. It was like three days before classes started, and I was like, I'm just going to take this psych class. It will be great. And it turned out to be amazing and a life-changing experience. The first person that I met in this class was the instructor. There are literally no pictures of her either in my personal collection or on the internet. We are now very good friends, and she just doesn't like pictures. So her name is Sandra England. She's one of the most instrumental people I've ever met like, in my life. She changed my life and is the reason I'm here today. And she's a tiny little five-foot-tall woman with so much energy, and she had very high expectations in her class was terrifying. But she was the first important connection that I made when I was a community college student. And there were many that would come to follow that would make me part of the academic community and really would become the support system that would um, lead me forward in my academic career. The second person, um, I put in this presentation not because of, of um, anything in particular that she, um, any one particular thing that she has done, but because of many things and who she is. She's a very dear friend of mine that I met in a psychology class. She's now finishing her master's degree in human services. Um, she is one of the hardest working and most inspirational people I've ever met. And there have been many times when I didn't think that I wanted to continue or that I wouldn't be able to do it. And all I had to do was call Anne Marie and she would inspire me and encourage me to keep on with whatever I was doing. The third person that I met, and this is definitely when the social support network I, um, that I had at community college started to take off and I started to feel less alone and better prepared um, to really take on academic challenges. This is Gabriel, and he is now in medical school at the University of Chapel Hill, also a community college graduate student. Um, he was the president of the um, uh, psychology club with me at uh, Quinn Sigmund. Um, it was defunct at the time when we started it, and Sandra came to us and said, oh, I think that you guys should start this club back up because it would be so much fun. We had no idea what a, a psychology club was or what being in charge of a club was. I was a homeschool kid. Like, I had no idea what this was. So Gabriel and I just like kind of under Sandra's direction started doing this, and it was great because along the way we learned a lot of leadership skills that would be really important in jobs that we would do later on in life. We had no idea about this at the time, but we took advantage of the opportunity and it really paid off. Um, we, as part of starting the psychology club, we started the honors club in psychology also. Um, 
which was a huge opportunity to get involved in conference presentations, and learn more about research, and networking with other honor society um, members around the New England community. The fourth person um, that became a really instrumental part of my network was uh, Jane Pickett. And Jane is the nicest lady ever. She ran the tutoring center at Kinsigman. And she gave me my first tutoring job. I will still never know why she gave it to me, because I had no experience and nothing to recommend me for a tutoring position, except that Sandra said, Jane, you should hire Steph. So um, I have continued to tutor forever. And because Jane had faith in me that first day, um, I still tutor now. I tutored all the way through for, uh, my, when I transferred from community college to a four-year school, I uh, tutored then. And now I work with um, in East Palo Alto with the Foundation for College Education. This guy I met through Jane, kind of indirectly. Jane recommended me to go to a breakfast for the Board of Higher Education in Massachusetts. They wanted to interface with some of the students and get their opinions on how running at school and what we could do better. And this guy shows up at the meeting and asks the director of the Board of Higher Education the most difficult and kind of like rude questions I've ever heard. And I'm like, who is this guy? And so we talked afterwards and he told me about the Student Government Association at Quinn Sigmund and encouraged me to get involved. I found out later because he had a crush on me, but um, it, was <laughs> it was really good opportunity to get involved in student government. Um, he's also graduated from community college and has gotten involved in politics. He told me that first day that he wanted to become the president of the United States and he is now well on his way. He successfully ran Charlie Baker's campaign for governor in, of the state of Massachusetts this year. So through getting involved in the Student Government Association, I went to a couple of talks where I met this woman, Sue McPherson. She was in charge of the honors program at Sigmund, and she um, encouraged all the students, like every student she met, to get involved in the honors program, primarily because they had personalized one-on-one -on -one academic advising. And I don't know how your academic advising is, I hope it's much better, but the one thing that Sigmund was not good at when I was a student was advising. They had kind of like group advising, and you kind of waited in this really long, messy line to see an academic advisor. And if you met with one, they gave you one piece of advice for your class, and if you met with a different one, they gave you a different piece of advice. And so I was sold, just based on the fact that I would get a different advisor. But we also got to take advantage of smaller class sizes, of um, extracurricular activities that were outside of the class. We got to go visit other schools and learn in a more inter interactive environment. And also, importantly, we got to interface with other students who were really motivated to take their life somewhere, somewhere that's beyond just being at community college. They wanted to have a future in some kind of um, four-year school and graduate school and beyond. So through the honors program, I got involved with Phi Theta Kappa. Um, it's an international honor society for junior colleges. This is a lifetime membership that you get. And working with Bonnie Coleman, um, who ran Phi Theta Kappa, cha Phi Theta Kappa chapter at Quinn Sigmund, um, I was able to get involved with a lot of community outreach, um, involved in a lot of fundraisers, and other things that would both allow me to give back to the community and would really help me with um, building a resume. And these are all just all these different events as I did them and went along, helped me to build a resume that allowed me to apply to a four-year school successfully get into a lot of different ones that I wanted to go to. So importantly out of all of this, and again back to Sandra England, she um, put me in touch with this lady, Misha, who was at the time a graduate student at Clark University in the psychology department. She was in men and masculinity studies, and she was looking for an intern for the summer to help her collect data for her PhD thesis. And at the time, like, I had no idea what a PhD thesis was. I wasn't really even totally aware of what research was, which is kind of comical in hindsight, seeing that's what I, like, all I do right now. Um, but Misha was thankfully very patient and very willing to be to, uh, a good teacher. And she taught, she allowed me to come help her collect data um, on her research. The first um, study that I worked on, she um, was looking at men's perceptions of masculinity and how they felt about themselves after a traumatic event like job loss. Um, and she, we went down to the, uh, the unemployment office in downtown Worcester. It's a little sketchy as an area, but again, it didn't bother me that much because I didn't even really know how. <laughs> I an idea it was to be there. Um, but we collected 
um, surveys, like one at a time from all these participants. I spent the whole summer like collecting her data, took forever. And then she taught me how to use a software program for analyzing this data that I would actually use quite heavily in uh, when I left consignment. So all of this was great, and I had a really great time, and I built a network that got me really excited about college. But then I had to move on. It was time to graduate. And so I had to make a decision about what would come next. And so thankfully, Sandra England, again, decided to kind of guide me along the way. And she encouraged me to apply to a four-year school. So I did. I applied to many four-year schools. I got accepted to all of them. Um, but because my family was kind of middle class, even though I wasn't paying any of this money for an education, um, I didn't get any financial aid. So fortunately, and I, I mean, I called and I begged them for money, and they're like, we'll give you $10,000. And I'm like, well, that's great, but $10,000 in a $40,000 year education on a waitress's salary is just not gonna cut it. So fortunately in Massachusetts, we have a transfer agreement. I know you guys have the same thing, but, um, if you're a community college graduate student, when you have anything over a 2.0, um, you can go to any of the state, the four-year state colleges, and you just go, you just transfer right in. So I did, and I transferred into the least expensive of them all, Bridgewater State College, and this turned out to be an excellent turn of events for my life. Um, and just for the, because I'm sure none, none of you have any idea what I'm talking about geographically, I grew up here um, in central Massachusetts, and I moved to Bridgewater, and this was also the first time I had ever lived alone, like on my own. I had moved out of my, my house. So it was a little bit scary and a little bit intimidating, and again, I didn't really have a super supportive network, um, but I was gonna build that very soon. So when I got to Bridgewater, um, this is the main campus. It's a beautiful, small liberal arts campus on the South Shore. Um, I thought because of all the work that I had done with the psychology club and how much of an influence my psychology instructor had been in my life that I wanted to major in psychology. Um, so I did and I signed up for whatever the first couple of requisite classes were for the major. Um, and one of them was a research and statistics method taught by this woman, Elizabeth Spivak. Um, I, it was the second serious class I've ever taken in my entire life, including graduate classes at Stanford. The expectations were high and you either met them or you didn't, and then and that was it. Um, but she really liked my work and my writing, and so she invited me to join her lab. And this was going to be a very important turning point in my academic career. Um, I would say if you ever get the chance to do research of any kind, you should definitely do it. And it, the reason is multifold, as I'll show you in a minute. So uh, I went to Elizabeth's lab meeting um, for the first time, and after I decided, that, like, yes, it was something I totally wanted to do, she put me together um, with Danielle Williams, who was my research mentor. Um, Danielle was working on a project as about escape style coping and self injury. So, um, more specifically, this can be cutting yourself or burning yourself or exercise addiction to the point of harm where it becomes unhealthy and obsessive. Um, and so, Danielle taught me how to. Um, take these surveys from students and how to collect data and then how to enter it into this program called SPSS, um, which like is just a statistical analysis software for social sciences. Um, so the problem with this was that Danielle was graduating very soon and it was going to become my project. So there was a lot of responsibility pretty quickly, but that was okay and I really was happy to be taking on the project. I started to, um, it was Danielle's help right before she graduated, I started to look at how escape style coping and self-injury was correlated with your mindset. And so um, temporal orientation, um, more specifically, we looked at this thing from Philip Zimbardo called time perspective. And so it's when you think um, about things, do you think about them in the present? Do so you just kind of consider what's right in front of you right now? Do you think about things that are very far in the future? Are you a planner? Do you like have the next like your five-year plan totally in place and you know everything's going on? Or are you um, a person who always has the past in mind and you're very aware of your um, past experiences and how those have turned out for you? So this is very interesting research that I really enjoyed. Um, but I also was starting to develop an interest more in biology. And so not just to understand the thought processes that go on in your mind, but also the cellular reasons and the, the underlying causes of those thoughts and those feelings and those chemical um, balances or imbalances, 
as you will. So when I took on this project, at first it was just my project, so I've gone from like being taught by someone to now working on my own, to then this guy, Josh Horton, joined the lab and became started working on the project with me. Later on, Kat Saucier would also join the lab and she would work with me on this project extensively. Um, she's become one of my dearest friends. And we turned this project into a more biological um, context. So we looked at how your body, how it like, responds, um, your heart rate, your blood pressure, um, the conductivity of your skin, they get, uh, they uh, change when you're nervous or when you're under some kind of pressure. Um, and, but this can be, this is not necessarily like, oh, stick your hand in cold water for an extended period of time. This can also be um, like some kind of cognitive stress, like I have an exam, or someone just called to give you really bad news, and this all starts to happen immediately as part of the fight or flight response. So what we did with the students is we had freshman psychology students come into our lab, and we sit them down in a chair, and we hooked them up to all this equipment that monitored all of their like, biological response, and then we would turn on a video camera and say, okay, surprise, you're going to give a speech, and it's going to be taped, and other people are going to see it and analyze it. And I'm pretty sure if I did that to any one of you right now, you'd be like, whoa, lady, that's not so cool. Um, and they also thought the same thing. But we found in the end that if you were present-oriented, you had the worst time dealing with this. You had the most reactivity, and you were less, the least able to cope, as opposed to having a future-oriented or a past-oriented. Um, this is important because over a, an entire lifetime, if this is your mindset, um, it puts more stress on your heart um, and just your body in general, so you're more prone to heart disease and diabetes and shorter lifespan, which is kind of like bold claims of that research, but that's kind of the implications that we have had found from that. Um, the other important thing that I got to learn, oh, and I should mention, as part of developing this study, I got to learn how to develop a scientific hypothesis, how to put it into place, how to design good research, how to ask good research questions, and what good research practices were. I also got to collect data and have to analyze it, so I learned a ton of things about statistics and how to present my, uh, my work in like a way that made sense or how to make sure that I had good research data. And that was all really important stuff that I would fall back on quite extensively later. So another thing that was really important that I learned in this lab was how to collaborate with others and how to give them help and also ask for help from them. And at the same time, it exposed me to more areas of research than I would have if I had stayed in my own research bubble. So Ivana Zerox and Megan Gilbert worked on women's health. And it is shocking the number of women between 18 and 25 years of age who know nothing about their physical health on just a survey of what women know about their health. So the results of this were that we were able to kind of devise a campus-wide um, initiative to educate women about their own health so that they can be, like, lead to happier, healthier lives. So that was pretty exciting. Um, they helped me, I helped them, and it was very much a team effort. Um, Andrea worked on athletic identity formation, and I, you know, when I joined Elizabeth's lab, I had no interest in athletics, really, at all, besides, like, pick up basketball. Um, but Andrea was really interested in at what age <coughs> you are when you decide, I'm a basketball player, I'm a runner, I'm an athlete. Are you five, are you 10, are you 15, are you 25? And lastly, um, Megan, um, also Megan, who extended the first research that I had started with Danielle Williams way back when I had joined the lab. She just finished that this year. And the important thing to take, that I took away from all of this was that not only were we learning how to do research with our colleagues, but they were also our friends. And so we built a support network around each other. Elizabeth's lab very much had a, um, an interesting mix of students with complicated life, lives. And so when we were all together, we were able to support each other in unique ways and encourage each other to stay on with our academic careers and to get through the test stuff so that we could get to what we knew was the end goal um, that would make our lives much better in the long term. Um, Another important thing that I got from Elizabeth's lab was the opportunity to present my research data at national conferences. And for those of you who know about psychology, this is Philip Zimbardo. And I mentioned that we got to, we like designed our project based around some of his work. And at one of the conferences we attended, we actually got to meet him, which is like totally the highlight of my academic career. It was fantastic. 
he came over, we like saw him talk, it was great, and then he came over to our poster later on, and um, he was like, oh my gosh, this is totally like the stuff that I did, I'm so excited you're incorporating it into your research. Cam, I have a copy of your poster so that I can incorporate it into this thing that I'm writing up. And Danielle and I were so excited. We were like, of course you can. And he was like happy to just chat with us about our research and it did actually follow up and it was great. So it demonstrated to me again the importance of networking and how important these like small random things that you don't think can be that important can really change your academic career. And I think if I pursued a career in psychology, it's something that I would have followed up on more extensively. Most importantly, this lab became my family. And as I said, it was important that we supported each other and helped each other through things. But that didn't stop when I graduated. They came to visit me in San Francisco after I moved here. They were at a conference in San Francisco, and they decided to stop by Stanford and went hiking. Um, and that's been important as it's gone on, especially for those of you who maybe don't have the biggest support network. It's important to find these people who you can call when you're like, I don't know how to put in this application. I don't know how to like write this paper or can you read it for me? Um, that was another thing that Elizabeth is really great at. She's got a master's degree in English, so she's very particular about writing. And that's the other thing I can't stress to you enough. Learn how to write and write well. It will pay off really well in the end. Um, find a friend. That's the other reason friends are important, because your friends will help you edit your work. Your writing is never good enough. It needs to be better. You can always improve it. You can always make it a little bit better. And if you just keep reading it, at some point, it's just not useful to you anymore. So having other friends who are really close with you and really care about your future, who can give you constructive feedback, really can make a difference in whether an admissions committee reads your application letter and says, like, oh yeah, you know, good, whatever. Or there's like, wow, this came from is great. We totally want them in our program. And it's a little thing, but sometimes the little things make a huge difference. Okay, so psychology was great, but as I mentioned before, I was really interested in the underlying biological processes. And obviously, I'm here because I'm in science. And that's the psychology, not science, because there's def definitely is. It's just different avenues of science that's a little bit um, different than the path that I should take. So I decided to get involved in the biology department of Bridgewater. Um, and because research had been so exciting and so instrumental in my life um, to already, I wanted to do research in the biology department as well. Because it also really taught me a lot about just the field. And I didn't want to miss out on that in biology. So I joined the lab of Meredith Kravatsky. She worked on cellular apoptosis, um, program cell death, and I was only in the lab for a year, but it was a very important year that launched a lot of other things that would come in the near future of my life. So primarily, and it's a little hard to see because of the light, but um, I worked on imaging of cells, um, cancer cells, and you can see that we have cells in different stages of division here, um, notably here and here, um, and for the most part, I just worked on taking images of them. I would look at either the cells plainly in a dish, or cells with a stain for the nuclear material, or cells with a set of cells with stain, and then you can overlay all of this and get an idea of where different components of the cell are at different points of time. And so I helped um, the other students in my lab optimize with their imaging I, um, for different proteins and um, things that they were working on. And it was then that I really fell in love with biological science. We worked in this really old basement, in this really sketchy old science building that's now been torn down. They've put this beautiful new one. Um, but I'd sit there for hours on weekends with like music blasting with my microscope, just sitting there like taking picture after picture after picture. And I loved it. I loved every minute of it, and it was great. So Mary knew that I loved it. Um, she let me present my work at conferences, again, just like I had done with Elizabeth, both uh, within Bridgewater, outside, nationally. It was a great experience. But most importantly, she introduced me to Sheila, who was who used to be Mary's student. Um, but Sheila was, at the time that I met her, a postdoctoral fellow at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. Sheila was looking for a summer intern. Again, very happy about all these summer internships. They totally changed my life. Um, and Sheila decided that it was totally fine if I went and work for her for a summer. And at the point that I met Sheila, I will never, um, I can never tell Sheila how thankful I am for the fact that she is an extremely, extremely patient woman who is an excellent teacher, because I didn't know anything about biology when I first started working with Sheila. And she had to teach me, for those of you who've done like a little bit of science work, she had to teach me how to use some basic science tools like my pets. I'd never used them before. And so thankfully Sheila taught me all of these things, 
and we had a really good summer research experience, which was fortuitous because I was also taking organic chemistry in the summer class and still working in waitressing, so I still had to pay for all of this learning. And it does not internship itself to not pay for. So just to clarify that you don't think that all I did at Bridgewater was really boring things, but I also had a lot of fun. Um, I joined the biology club in Tribea and became the president of them, building on leadership skills that I had started to develop at Quinn Sigmund because I really enjoyed being part of the decision-making process of clubs. I also continued my work in psychology with the psychology club in Psych High. Um, at, Quinn, at Bridgewater, the honors clubs and the regular clubs tend to function kind of as one cohesive unit. But we got to um, do all kinds of fundraising walks. We raised, did a couple walks to raise money for the American Cancer Society. Um, we did a bunch of bake sales and all kinds of stuff. But for the most part, it was just a fun way to like see other students who were passionate about what I was passionate about, and to share that with them, my ideas, and again to build the, these friendships that we really helped to encourage each other through our education. I also continued to be on the S Student Government Association, which um, put me in touch with a lot of really important people, um, which was an opportunity that I didn't really at any point think that much of. But looking back, it was an it was an excellent opportunity if I wanted to continue a career and something that was more um, of a law career or a politics career. And the president of our school was good friends with the governor, and so the governor would like, come visit us all the time, and we just thought, like, oh yeah, the governor's coming to visit again. Like, this is such an imposition. But it's something that was, could be really good and worked out really well for, my, for a couple of my friends who are now law students. Um, again, through this whole time, I was still working, but the work environment was fun and social, and I really enjoyed it. But then again, we came to the point where I had to graduate. And graduation was really exciting and really fun, but I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I didn't know at this point in time that I wanted to dedicate my life to research. I was still kind of toying with the idea of going to medical school. And I should say that I could definitely have gone to graduate school immediately at this point. Like all the extracurriculars that I had done, all the research I had done, prepared me for a graduate school position. However, I will say that I don't think that it was enough to get me into Stanford, especially seeing <coughs> excuse me, the applicants that we get at Stanford for the graduate program. I was ready for a, graduate, a good graduate school, um, but if, you know, if this, the caliber of graduate school is important to you, then you pay ten, close attention to the next thing that I did. So first, I decided that I at least needed to work in my field that I had spent all this time getting a, a bachelor's degree in. So I got a job in biotech. So for those of you who know about biotech, it's very rigorous and it's very structured. Um, and I found this very boring because I had been able to work um, on my own research projects. Like I had designed whole projects with this sort of like the idea, like the, the fruit of mouth of my ideas, and it was great and I loved it. But this, everything was like an SOP, it was all standardized, you didn't think, you didn't ask questions, you just did exactly what they told you. I am not good. So it was a temporary position when I got hired. It was only for six months, and so the entire six months, I just kept applying for other research positions. Even though, like, biotech's a great way to make money. I, you know, right out of college, I made a decent salary, and I was pretty happy about that, but I really, really hated what I did. So by, again, a fortuitous stroke of fate, I landed a job at one of the best places in Boston, um, Harvard Medical School. It's this beautiful, beautiful campus with the, some of the most groundbreaking research in the world. And I was so excited when I got the call for the interview. I ended up getting the job uh, working for Daniela Danilescu in cancer stem cells, um, ovarian cancer stem cells to be specific. And what I didn't know before I got hired was that Daniela was not real excited about hiring a community college and state college graduate. She was used to students in her lab coming in with a pedigree from Harvard and Yale and Northeastern and what have you. So she stepped out and took a leap of faith. I and mean, we are now very, very good friends and she's helped me a lot through my career and I'm very glad she gave me that opportunity. Part of the reason she gave me the opportunity was because this girl, Shannon McCullough, um, told her that she needed to hire me. When I interviewed, I made a good impression on Shannon. And thank goodness that I did because it was important. It also worked out well that I had made a good impression working with Sheila Schreiner when I was a, an intern in the summer in her lab, because unbeknownst to me, and though I did not give Daniela um, Sheila's number, 
Daniela called Sheila and asked her if it was worth hiring me and if I would be a good employee. Thankfully, Sheila really liked me and said that I would be. Um, but science is a small community, and so it, the community kind of all like compiled on itself when I got this job in a good way for me. But it was it demonstrated to me that it's very important never to burn your bridges because if I had really upset Sheila and Danielle called her, I would not be at Stanford right now. So again, as I was with Elizabeth's lab when I had first started there, I was back at the bottom and being a trainee. Although, interestingly, again, this didn't last for very long because Shannon was going to graduate school. So Shannon had submitted a paper, and I don't know how much you know about paper submissions in science, but this is kind of like the make or break. It's like currency. The bigger and better and more papers you have, the like, more people care about what you do. So Shannon had submitted a paper with Daniela probably a month before I got there, and they were waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for the people at the paper to say, like, is the paper accepted, is it not accepted, what do we need to change? And the paper came back, all of this feedback got returned to us the day before Shannon left. And so Daniela almost had a meltdown. She's like, you know everything there is to know about this project, and now I have to leave it with this kid, who I'm not totally convinced can handle it. Um, so I had a lot to prove at this point, and thankfully I did. Uh, over the course of the summer, we, I did all the work that the reviewers of the paper had asked for and published the paper. Daniela was so pleased that she um, put me as first author on the paper, and that really made a difference in my graduate school application. More importantly, um, Daniela gave me her trust after that, and she believed in me to be able to do more work in her lab and take on more responsibility and to be able to do whatever I wanted to do. And having someone's trust and having someone's faith, um, especially someone who is a Harvard's PhD um, faculty member, is not a trivial thing. Um, Daniela is a very successful woman in the field of science. She developed the first mouse model of ovarian cancer with Tyler Jack at MIT. And um, having somebody like that who can make a phone call or write you a letter of recommendation is a huge deal. It can make a big difference. And just to you know, model yourself in your career, this is a very successful woman in science, and now she's a very good friend of mine that I can ask advice from and support from for any point in the future. So I also want to note that I worked with this guy, Greg Lyons, for a long time. Greg was my only um, other lab member. But we gradually convinced Daniela that we need more help. So as I had done with Elizabeth's lab, I started taking on more mentoring positions. And I mentored, trained, and hired all three of these guys, who are still working in the lab now. Matthew actually was a summer student um, and is now working at Children's Hospital. And he depends very heavily on the skills that I taught him. And I'm just glad that I was able to teach them to him and that I was in a position to do that. So um, to go a little bit more to the research side, when I worked with Daniela, um, I worked with um, chemo resistance. And how many of you know about cancer stem cells? A couple of you, OK. So we call them cancer stem like cells because this is a little bit of a touchy issue. Um, but basically, you have a tumor that's made of cells that are sensitive to treatment and resistant to treatment. And when you first get cancer, the cells that are sensitive to treatment are much more abundant than the cells that are not sensitive to treatment. So you treat it, you, you know, give your chemotherapy, and all of the um, treatment sensitive cells die. And then you're left with only like these resistant ones. And the reason that they're a problem is because they'll pump out the, ke the chemotherapy. They won't stay inside the cell. So you, can you can't kill them. And so they go to other places in the body, and they grow there. And when they grow, they give rise to both more of themselves, the more stem cells, and also more non-stem cells. Um, so they're just this like beast that can grow for all of time, and big, bad, and ugly. So there's a lot of work right now focused on trying to target these cells. Um, they come by all different names, but they definitely is a resistant population of cells. So we did a lot of background screening and a lot of preliminary analysis, and all of it pointed to the fact that notch signaling was important in ovarian cancer. We looked at um, we looked at notch because primarily it was upregulated in almost a third of the most common commonly identified type of serous ovarian, uh, of ovarian cancer, which is serous ovarian cancer. Interestingly, NOTCH is also a very important player in uh, de normal cellular development. It needs to be activated for normal growth and development to occur. Um, and these are often the pathways that get mutated in cancers, 
and you can pump that. Mm -hmm. Notch is like just a protein, and it there's a gene and a protein, and they go and regulate like other cellular processes that like go on and on and on and on. So it's mostly just a name for a protein. Um, did I answer your question? Yeah. Um, so there are four different types in mammals. In flies, there's just I think there's just one in flies, but there's four in mammals. And so, like notch one, like just the first variant of the protein, is important in um, uh, non-solid tumors, um, in a lot of um, like blood malignancies. Whereas the notch three we found to be important in ovarian cancer, but notch two, like the second variant, is important in brain tumors. So like different versions of it will do different things. Um, most interestingly for us, there was already a drug available for um, treatment of, of inhibition of the notch pathway. And this was important for our research because if you try to get a drug approved by the FDA for using patients, it's very difficult and very time consuming and a very much natural battle. So if you already have a drug that's FDA approved for use in patients, you can repurpose and say like, this can work great to treat cancer. It's much easier to actually get that into a clinical setting much faster. So the summary of what we found was that if we inhibited um, the notch signaling pathway with um, this gamma synchronous inhibiting drug, we could eliminate the cancer stem cells. You shifted them so that they kind of froze and they were no longer able to pump out the drug. And they looked more like a non-stem cell population. So our model that we proposed in our paper was to not just treat the initial tumor with a chemotherapeutic agent, um, which would give you the cancer-resistant stem cells and like more tumors for and a like faster rate of death, for lack of a better way to put it. Uh, that if you treat first with your chemotherapeutic agent and an notch inhibitor, you get a, a tumor that looks all like a, a chemosensitive tumor, and all of them die in response to the chemotherapeutic agent, and you have very, um, very few, um, very few relapse um, incidences. Um, your uh, your survival over a longer period of time is extended. So importantly, the thing that I took away from Daniela's lab was three first author papers, which, as I mentioned before, papers are like gold in science. The more you have, the happier everyone is. So this put me in an excellent place to apply to any graduate program that I wanted to apply to. But my problem was that I still had this inferiority complex because I knew that I didn't have the pedigree to apply to some of these places like, like Harvard, like MIT, because I was a community college and state college graduate. And so I felt like I needed to really still prove myself and like I wouldn't get into any graduate schools. This was a very silly thought that I had. I applied to 13 schools because I was so afraid I wouldn't get into any of them. I got interviews from 10 of them, which is just like unheard of. I accepted eight of them because it's like physically impossible to travel to interview with all these schools. And I ended up choosing between Duke and Stanford. Um, that was, was obviously, you know, I chose Stanford. Um, but if you'd asked me when I first went to school, when I first started community college, and I was like a homeschool kid who had no idea what I was doing, if I would end up with this life choice at some point, I would have told you definitely not. But all the people that I met along the way who had cared enough to give me a chance to like take a risk, and I was willing to do it too. Like, so when someone presents you an opportunity and says, here, I'm willing to like kind of make a risky decision by hiring you, like you have to have the initiative to then go say, like, yes, you should hire me. Sometimes you have to fight for it. Sometimes you have to say, like, I know you don't want to, but I will work really hard for you and I will do the best job that I can do. And that's all that I did to get here, and that's the opportunity that it gave me. So for the first time in my life, I moved not just a little bit outside the state that I grew up in, I moved all the way across the country um, to Stanford. And that was definitely intimidating, but I was so, so excited. When I got to Stanford, I got to work with some of the best researchers that we know. Uh, Mario Sorne works on neurons. He takes uh, fibroblast cells, which are kind of just like your normal skin cells, and he can turn them into neurons. The fact that you can do this is huge. Everybody's really excited about this, and he's since taken 
many, many different kinds of cells in terms of the neurons, which has huge implications for, um, for neurodegenerative diseases and injuries. Um, so if you're like in a car accident and you lose, like you're paralyzed, if we can regrow neurons and nerves and sensory, um, sensory signals in your body, that's a huge, huge exciting thing. So I got to work with him for a little while because when you're in graduate school, you do this thing called rotation and you work in a lab for like a couple of months and get to learn all about their research and their people inside from one another lab. So it was really great, but as you can imagine, from a lab that does this kind of like crazily exciting stuff, it was really intense. And I wanted to see the light of day occasionally. Um, so then I rotated with this guy who works on vitamin D receptor in breast cancer and circadian rhythms in cancer, which are just kind of like how the cells, like so your cells are always doing the same thing at the same time. So sometimes they are on and sometimes they're off and different functions of your cells are on or off at different times. And the most common example of this is sleep. Um, people are trained to sleep in conjunction with daylight because it's easier to do things because we can see things when the sun is out. But interestingly, when you treat people for uh, chemotherapy, it's better to give it to them at a specific time of the day. They respond better to it because the cells in your body are cycling differently, and so they'll respond to the drug differently, and you'll get more or less sick, and the drugs will be more or less effective at different times of day. So this was really interesting research, and I really loved it, and Brian was a great mentor. But in the end, I joined the lab of Kevin Wong because he worked on something that I had no experience in prior to this, um, which was um, chromatin remodeling and epigenetic regulation of DNA, um, and most importantly, on non coding RNA. However, even though I had done all of this research, and it was great, and I was working with these really famous biologists on really novel problems, and Stanford had all kinds of research money, which is great, because they have really fun research toys, and so you can just be like, I want to do this. And so he's like, we have the toys to do that. And it's really, really a wonderful experience. I didn't really feel like I belonged there. And I didn't really start to until I got the Graduate Research Fellowship. The National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship is insanely, insanely competitive and all the Stanford students apply for it in their first year. And I was the only person in my program in my year last year to get this fellowship. And I finally felt, I finally started to feel like I, all the work I had put in, all the bartending, all the waitressing, all of the finals and exams and staying up half the night to get all the stuff that I had to do was worth it because I found that it was paying off and I had beat out all the other students in my program who are from Harvard, from Yale, from MIT, who have like, who have excellent, excellent, excellent education and I like am competing against them every day. I got this fellowship and I really started to feel like I deserve to be at Stanford. So when you feel like you are the only one who feels alone and like you're struggling and like you don't know if you can do this because you don't have the same education as some of these other kids that you run into, don't doubt that you can, because you can, and you can do it. Um, but it, you're not the only one who like doubts yourself a lot of times. So now that I'm in Kevin's lab, I work on three different projects. Two of them are very, I don't want to say like more logical projects, but kind of. And the third one is kind of random. Um, but I stuck it in the middle of what I'm going to show you. So when we think about DNA, and I'm sure from like your high school biology classes and whatnot, if you think about DNA, you kind of think about it as a linear shape. But in reality, when it's inside your cell, it's all bundled up kind of like spaghetti. And so uh, different parts of the DNA will touch each other, even though they might not be close to each other in linear space. So this purple part, let's say that this is the on-off switch for your gene, it will come into contact with the green gene or the red gene, and it will turn one or the other of them on. Um, and so if you, it comes in contact with the green gene, green is going to transcribe, it comes in contact with the red gene, red is transcribed, and if it comes in contact with nothing, then there's no transcription, the gene is just not there. So what I'm working on currently in the lab, with some measure of success in my lab, um, is doing this on purpose. So rather than just letting the cells do it at will, I want to take um, some biotech, fancy pieces of biotechnology, and do it whenever I feel like it with whatever genes I want to. And so far, we, this is promising and it's working well. The interesting implication for this, for cancer therapy, is that um, a lot of genes are turned on when they shouldn't be. So if all I can do, if all I have to do is put this fancy piece of biotech into the cells, and I can turn the genes off, but simply by moving this, well in this case it's red, but let's pretend, let's go back here. So if all I have to do is move the purple and the red to be purple and green, and I can 
turn down the expression of the cancer gene. That's really exciting, and you don't delete the gene, because when you delete the gene, it causes a lot of problems for cells in general. They don't really like to just globally have delete, delete, gene deletion. So the second thing that I'm working on, this is the random one, is um, this stuff called royal jelly. Royal jelly has been used in homeopathic medicine um, for many, many years. People think it does everything from like curing cancer to the common cold, although there's no like hard and fast evidence for this. However, in honeybees, it's responsible for their size. So the queen bees get fed this royal jelly, the bees produce it themselves. They feed it to their queen larvae, and they grow to a significantly larger size than do the workers or the drones. Now, if you look along like the evolutionary path of, path of things, honeybees and mammals are not really that close. And so when we put this royal jelly stuff onto our mammalian stem cells, and they stay looking like stem cells, we were shocked because normally you have to put in this stuff called lith to stem cells in order to make them stay stem cells. If you withdraw lith, they just they'll differentiate into whatever kind of cells. And they can be skin cells, neurons, cardiomyocytes, whatever you tell them you kind of want them to be. So without this stem cell maintenance factor over down here, you can see, we can get stem cells to stay stem cells with royal jelly. And this is a really, really strange phenomenon. And in biology, sometimes the really strange things are the coolest and the most exciting. So we're currently characterizing this in mammalian stem cells in both um, mouse and human embryonic stem cells. Uh, with some success, and we're looking at how it affects the chromatin, how it affects the cell morphology, and it's been a really, really strange project, but it's really fun because it's cool, and it's just random and exciting, and it's fun to be able to do that kind of stuff in biology. The last thing that I'm working on, oh wait, before I do that, I want to ask you a question. How much do you know about RNA? A little bit? Mm -hmm. All right, does somebody want to name a kind of RNA? Like, there's a bunch of different how many can you name, like, as a group? Like, just anybody. Yep. Okay, good. So, like, if you had a guess, like, how many of you think there's, like, maybe, like, five RNAs? Yeah? More than five? Three? Three. More than 20? All right, well, people who are in the more than 20 group, you win. So, I know I kind of spoiled it. This is just a small subset of all the different kinds of RNAs that have been identified. This paper here, which if you really like reading scientific papers, I strongly encourage you to check out, has a list that this is, like I said, this is just a subset of the list in this paper of all the different kinds of RNAs and their function. Most of these are non-coding, so they don't have um, a known function, they don't encode for a protein, they're regulatory RNAs or some other variant of RNA that does not actually code for a protein. This is a very, very exciting new field in biology. And if you're interested in biology, I would encourage you to consider the field of RNA because it, it, there's so little known about it. People have like identified these and there's new ones being identified every week. And there's a new thing that's discovered that they do every single week. Um, and so this is definitely a huge exploding field of biology that has ample opportunity for people to become interested in and work in it and make important discoveries in the near future. So the, in spe specifically, what I'm interested in with RNAs is looking how RNAs and proteins interact to regulate all different processes in the cell. There's this technology called CLIP, it's cross-linking and immunoprecipitation, and you cross-link the RNA to the, um, to the protein in the cell, and then you pull out the protein by itself from the entire cell, and you analyze it with, um, with uh, like high frequency sequencing, and look at how many different RNA species are bound to the protein. And it can tell you a lot about what the protein's function is or what the function of the RNA is, depending on what is known about the, about the protein or the RNA already. Um, so that kind of brings us up to date where we are in my research and in my life. Um, and I want you to take home, if you literally take nothing else away from this, I want you to remember that you should take care, advantage of every opportunity that is presented to you. Don't ever turn one down because you think you're too busy or you have too much homework, or you don't think that you can do it. Well, that would be the worst one of all, because you can do it. And you'd be surprised how many things you can do when you, if you just try them. Um, and when you do that, give everything 110%. Um, they will not, giving a lot of effort will at least be recognized by other
other people and it will not come back to you void. Um, again, I want to emphasize that it's who you know because the networks and the people that you are friends with are very important. I, Ryan Kaplan, all the way back from Queen Sigmund, who's working in politics in Boston, was able to get a friend of mine a job. And she has no idea who he is, but I knew him and she knows me. And she likes working in politics. So I called him and I said, hey, I have a friend who needs a job. And he got her a job. Um, and this happens all the time. It happens more commonly than you'd think. So don't be afraid to just put yourself out there a little bit and make plenty of friends and contact everybody you can. And don't be afraid also to, um, if you have a field that you're interested in, call a lab. You're in great proximity to Stanford. People love free help. You know, I'm sure if you come here, going to say, like, can I come work with you for a week, for a month, for a summer? I will volunteer my time because I don't know anything about research and I really want to learn from you that even if they can't help you in your particular lab, they'll send you somewhere that you can get that information from. So don't be afraid to do that. Um, and with that, I will take any questions. And in the interest of networking and making contacts, this is my email. You're welcome to email me at any time. I'm more than happy to answer your questions or give you advice or whatever you want. I'm happy to help you. So I'll take any questions you have. No questions. I must have said things really well. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. 
class at eight, I'd get out of class at one. I would do, you know, whatever the club, the extracurricular was until like four, and then I would even go to work. And I would work probably until like, you know, 10 o'clock, and then go home and study and um, rinse repeat until it's probably about midnight or whatever. But I didn't work every day. I worked like uh, Thursday through Sunday usually. Sometimes Monday through Sunday. Um, so I'd have a couple days off that were a little bit flexible if I had exam stuff, which is why like having a good network at where you're working of other students who are, uh, like of other people who are primarily students can be helpful because you all have different exams and stuff. So it's like, oh, I have a midterm this week, like can you cover my shift? It sometimes gets a little bit easier that way. Um, Other questions? I'm also available for more questions afterwards if you guys like need any, like don't want to ask in front, but you want to ask in front.